today that have been there uh, for years by Woodlawn and given their location through natural and, and areas of the site we think that's totally inappropriate, but nevertheless, that would, that, so that requires a waiver from the ordinance. That if I could just uh, insert this, Mr. Pillen, because I think you made reference to one of the waivers, but may have not had the specific section. Um, the requested waiver having to do with the cold sat street lane, not to exceed 700 feet, is subdivision and lane development ordinance section 16039, capital B is in void, one in grant. The additional waiver having to do with uh, paving of the pedestrian pathways that Mr. Clacken just referred to is subdivision and land development ordinance section 160 42, capital A 12. Resources. Uh, Tom had indicated a desire to do more of the historic resources. 
and John summarize our, our situation. And so we have agreed, and certainly I think this is part of the original application that these buildings were all documented before they would be demolished, and they would also be made available for relocation or professional service. Can I just stop you there because that's a point I don't think we've made mention enough. That that is if and these are class three structures, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And the applicant has offered that if anyone wants to come and take these buildings and relocate them on their own property, they're free to do that, correct? <laughs> Condition for the property. 
We really want to look hard at existing drainage patterns. We've identified 11 <coughs> analysis points on the property. And the idea is to understand what is the drainage at each of these analysis points in the pre-developed and in the post-developed conditions. We then further analyze the, the flow rates in pre-developed, post-developed. Um, within the properties and the streets, we define preliminary level grading. And then in the subdivision land development ordinance, there's a provision, it's 16023B, 25E, talks about a schematic diagram of proposed method of stormwater management as a preliminary plan requirement. So this is an example where diagrammatically we provide information relative to the footprint of a stormwater management facility um, that coincides with preliminary grades that we have on the properties and the streets. At a final plan level, when we do final <coughs> stormwater testing at each facility, and then we do final per lot grading for driveways, um, the, around the lots themselves, we start to look at slope requirements. Um, there's sort of a marriage between the slopes, little retaining walls, and then transitions from the backyards into the stormwater management facilities. But when we do the testing, then we have a much better understanding of where we want to set the bottoms of these basins. And at that point, we provide the detailed grading associated with the basins and any walls that we might want to integrate at the backs of these properties kind of find that balance between sizing of the basin and also grading of the lot. Um, that is similar for erosion and sediment control. The plans right now show a preliminary level of erosion and sediment control that focuses on perimeter control. When we get to the final plan stage, uh, as is discussed uh, in terms of the details for the stormwater management ordinance, we will provide details of uh, erosion sediment control on a phase-by-phase -phase basis uh, to coincide with the final plan requirements as well as the requirements for outside regulatory agencies such as the Delaware County Conservation District for their adequacy review for the erosion sediment control plan but also the NPDS stormwater management requirement. Um, getting on to the rest of the letter, approximately seven of the comments are PennDOT related. Uh, so these are relative to Beaver Valley Road, um, and they are acknowledged that it's information that needs to be dealt with during the PennDOT process during the final plan stage. There's approximately 10 uh, technical comments. I would classify them as minor technical comments, and I'll just briefly go over those. And similar to what Dennis had said about a few comments in Mr. Uh, Committed's letter, uh, these are comments that, that we will comply with, that we, that we agree to address those as part of the subsequent final plan submission. Um, briefly, uh, they are uh, on your letter. Comment number three relative to the subdivided out parcels. Uh, we had identified them in terms of location and size and number. The request was made that is, that, um, to show where they're connected, the parent property they're connected to, particularly the back three parcels, because there needs to be an understanding from the township level how they have road frontage out towards Route 202. So that uh, full picture of those adjoining parcels will be provided. Uh, the next comment is relative to cul-de-sacs. Um, as Mr. Uh, Jarris has indicated, we have, uh, we'll be adding that as a, as a waiver. Uh, this is really relative to the requirement about a, a maximum length of 700 foot of cul-de-sac. This is a creative loop. Uh, street designer talked at length at the last planning commission about this. Um, no segment exceeds 700 feet. Uh, we have strategically placed emergency accesses out for each phase out to Beaver Valley Road and then one access that crosses uh, the colonial pipeline. So the idea is that we have at least two points of access to each phase of the development. Next, there's a comment, uh, comment number 4C relative to maximum slope to fence adjacent to lot 34 and 35. Uh, we have three to one slope proposed. This is the area right up on the north side of the property. We were actually trying to trim back how much we disturb into those wooded areas, uh, but it's different between a three to one and a four to one slope, so that's something that we will take a closer look at and incorporate. So comment 4D is relative to providing clear site distance lines. Uh, we have provided clear site distance triangles at this point, but we will certainly add those site distance lines uh, to the plans. Um, comment number five is relative to driveways, and uh, it's requested that we add notes to the plan relative to clear site distance and obstructions 
uh, relative to driveways. Turning to comment uh, 6B, uh, this is a reiteration of the comment relative to the paths within the walking trails, and this is that discussion about the requirement that they be paved. And as uh, Mr. Black and Pat Jarris have indicated, we are requesting a waiver from that provision. Uh, just a few more here. Um, moving on to comment number 17. Uh, this is actually a new comment, and, and the request has been made uh, to take a look at an existing 15-inch culvert that crosses under Smith Bridge Road. We've been asked uh, in the subsequent submission to take a look at the capacity of that, which we will do. Um, the last few, uh, these are new comments, and this is 26A, B, and C. These are some minor um, items that were requested to be added to the plan relative to um, the detail of the crosswalk, the detail for the quarry fencing, and also a cross-sectional detailed emergency access drive to be provided. So I realize it's kind of very brief, um, but I at least wanted to let you know with these two civil engineering related, site engineering related items, the fire marshal um, and the township engineer, uh, we've taken a hard look at them. I think we are down to uh, some minor technical comments with um, items to be deferred uh, to final plan as, uh, as I discussed earlier. Two quick questions for Mr. Black and, and Mr. Close before we turn it back to the planning commission for any questions you may have. With respect to the comments contained in the latest iteration of the Township Planner's Review Letter and the Township Engineer's Review Letter, do either of you see any major issues raised in those letters with respect to the proposed development? No, I don't. I, I, don't know. I believe the issues are all workable and, and with confidence that we can incorporate those into the plan. I would, I would agree with that. The, uh, the comments in terms of the landscape we can certainly address on the other items I think uh, we dealt with and the open space for instance seems to be compliant. So the landscape items we can address. And as I stated earlier, Mr. Hammond is, is in the audience this evening. But Mr. Hammond, did I correctly characterize the state of the traffic and traffic improvements with respect to the last presentation you gave and how that is being undertaken by PennDOT to review at this juncture? Uh, that is correct. There's excuse me, no additional information to add at this point. From a traffic perspective, the traffic study has been revised uh, based on some comments we received previously has been resubmitted, uh, but at this time, uh, the remaining issues are uh, to be dealt with by PennDOT as Beaver Valley Road is a PennDOT road and AP road. And at this juncture, I'll turn it back to the Planning Commission with respect to any questions you may have with respect to the consultants who just spoke. I also would like to note that um, Mr. Cordray is here as well. He has not uh, planned to present anything this evening. But uh, present, if any issues come up with respect to uh, the wetlands and those particular issues related to the property, uh, if there is any question by the planning commission where we are in the procedure, I would like to represent the planning commission that, as far as the applicants are concerned, thank you, Mr. Benjamin, that we are in a position to request from the planning commission this evening a recommendation on the application conditioned upon satisfying the issues raised by both the township engineer and the township planner uh, with respect to the review letters. And I was just handed was just handed a, another memorandum that appears from the Brandywine Conservancy dated October 20th, which is today's date, which appears to be a uh, three-page memo had we uh, had an opportunity to review this before this evening's meeting, perhaps we could have been prepared to respond to it, but unfortunately, just being handed uh, this evening, we're unprepared to do so. But perhaps we'll get some of the issues with respect to any questions you or any other ladies and gentlemen in the audience may have. So I, I turn back to the Planning Commission with respect to any specific questions of our consultants at this point. Mr. Jarris. Um, 
in going through Tom Committee's letter, he devotes Section 8 to the historic resources that are located on the track. This board finds this a very important topic. Okay. And we agree with Tom Committee that three of the five homes on the track classified as uh, class three structures could, should, maybe, could be incorporated into your plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's in favor of that. I'll make an assumption. With, with all the issues that are still outstanding. Is it possible that some of these homes could be looked at further? Mr. Perlin, first let me state the applicant's position on the record and be clear. The township created this cluster development in their zoning ordinance in the R2D district. Didn't make it a conditional use, didn't make it a special exception. As you've heard us state several times, they made it a use by right. That is, there's no evidentiary procedure to go through to prove that you have the ability to go ahead and develop under this cluster option. Mr. Charles, Mr. Charles, with all due respect, we're trying to keep this meeting moving. Can you just answer the question? I'll go right to the point then. Thank you very much. The, we understand that there may be a sentiment uh, to try and preserve these historic structures. But in creating the cluster development, there is a sentiment to try and encourage saving historic structures. But when you look at how these structures have been classified by the township with their historic inventory through the historic commission, they are what's known as class three structures. There's class one, there's class two, there's class three. As designated class three structures, there was there is no prohibition of a developer to raise or take down these types of class three structures. Now, having said that, we understand the sentiment that you've expressed. We would be willing to continue to try and talk to the township on this issue, on this issue should they so desire between preliminary and final land development. I cannot make any promises tonight with respect to these structures, but if the request is will you continue to have a dialogue with us as to what you could possibly do to save one or more of the structures, then the answer would be yes. I also have a letter from the Concord Township Historical Commission that I've been asked to read into. Is that a new one that we have been provided to? August 11, 2014. Oh, okay. This is an August 11, 2015 um, memorandum from the Congress Township Historical Commission, and this has previously been made part of the Can, can someone talk to, about tree protection? Being that uh, this track <coughs> contains high quality woodlands and is part of the National Heritage Inventory, has there been any survey to the large size trees over 36 inch caliper? It's coming yeah. to our attention that there are several that are if not the oldest in the county, close to it. And another issue with us would be, you know, certainly we'd like to see if we could save them. With, I'll have Mr. Black comment on this, but uh, two points. One is the township has no natural features protection standards in place 
similar to what I mean this point, uh, with respect to woodlands, steep slopes, um, floodplains, etc. Short winded way of saying there's nothing prohibiting taking down trees in conjunction with this type of cluster development. Come on, our rights. Thank you. Having said that, when you look at a requirement of 40% open space, all you need to do is look at the plan and see how many trees are not being disturbed. With respect to your question, it's going to be a long evening, I guess, if we have to follow that procedure. But um, with respect to your uh, question, there is an option that the ordinance offers, which we have taken advantage of, rather than go and inventory every tree of 12-inch caliber or greater, the ordinance permits us to take a representative area and count how many trees are in that representative area and extrapolate across the balance of the 230 acres. And I believe that particular provision was adopted for just this type of, of development. And we've got 230 acres. Old growth. So, having said that, Mr. Blanken, I don't know if you were, Ms. Thomas, if you wanted to add anything with respect to that. Good evening, my name is Lisa Thomas, I'm the Project Landscape Architect. Um, what John mentioned is exactly what we did. We went out and looked at the vegetation, and we took the option to, to do a forest density study on the site. And I wanted to explain a little bit about how we did it. So what we did was we went out and looked at the existing vegetation, and we selected three areas within which to study. We, went and tried to find three areas where we felt it was the densest in the, in the separate vegetative spaces. Um, we looked at this area up in here and selected a spot for study. We looked over, oh, I'm sorry, the northeastern section of the site. Uh, we selected a 100 by 100 foot area and we staked it out. So the stakes and the flags are still in the field. In the northwest side, we also selected another area. And then in the southwest side, we looked at where the woodlands were and selected another area. So there are three different areas that we looked at. We staked out a 100 by 100 foot area, and we counted up the number of 12 inch or greater trees in those areas, and then applied it across those sections of the site in terms of how many trees were 12 inches or greater. And that's how we came to our calculations, which are rather extensive on the plan. And you can see, as has been mentioned, this was the denser area up here, and those numbers prove it. The northeast corner, thank you. The, south, the northwest corner is a little less dense, and then the southwest area was a little bit less dense. So we did look at the density, we looked at the trees, and we did a representative stand. And as I said, we worked really hard to find the densest area in the space. We took a number of different areas in the and set them on the areas that were pretty dense. So that's how we've addressed the existing vegetation and the replacement trees with our populations. That, that would be in any area of the township, right? No, on the site. I know, but I'm just saying, that's, that's the typical ordinance requirement. The ordinance allows a forest density study. But I mean, being that this particular site is in the National Heritage Inventory, and you're aware of that, I assume. Yes. Was there no, I mean, I, I, I gather there's no requirement for you to look for large old trees. Well, we picked the areas where the trees were the biggest, to do a 100 by 100 foot area, and the density of the trees, greater than 12 inches, that out. Um, so we, we were looking for a typical 100 by 100 foot area that was the densest of that particular area. And for the for a number. For a number of per yeah. But I mean that, that, that's what you were looking for, some representative area to give a number. Yes, and within those areas I'm sure there were large trees also. I mean we weren't trying yes. we were trying to address the fact that but you weren't looking for large trees. We were not surveying these of um, any size. Right. We were that, doing that's what I meant. Studies. So, 
you weren't looking for, I mean, so if, if we told you that Dill was the largest or the oldest train in Delaware County was on the site, you wouldn't know. We, we didn't do a three survey. You're not required. We are not. And you don't plan on doing it, right? No, not at this time. So, so, so the fact that this is in a national heritage inventory, that really doesn't matter, does it? Well, we addressed it through our density study, and there were more trees and bigger trees in the density study. So that's how it was. But that would be the case whether it is or it isn't in the industry. That would be correct, but the density of the forest and the type of forest it is does come through the windows. Compared to what? Compared to what? It's dense. We know it's dense. Ma'am, if you're going to keep commenting, you're going to have to leave. It's about the eight, nine years old. The three sites that you selected would be supported with the density on the higher line? Yes, it's the gradient density. <coughs> and, then, and then the other two were less than less. Were they put are they the three most dense on the lot? In the areas of the vegetation being removed, what we did was we looked for the most the trees in the most area to the best of our ability. So we focused on an area of most density because we did we wanted to address that. We didn't want to try to find a less density. Just so I understand, the second other, other than the North East, the other two said were less. Yes, so because... Put, put your, they're less than the North East, but are they the three? Those three are they the most dense on the property? The best of our ability, yes.
we selected an area right in here. You know, that's not being disturbed. We found that to be um, very dense. Yes, just to the north of the most developed portion um, in between the um, two strings. And then down in the southeast, southwest section, we selected this area right here. That is um, almost the end of the cul-de-sac in the southeast, southwest corner. So you spoke to the best of your ability. How do you determine what gray areas are, what, what are the, what's the process to determine what the top three areas are? You said the best of your ability. Is it so, topography? No, it's going out there and looking at the density, visually looking at the density of the trees. We selected <laughs> other areas um, on the plan and put stakes in and counted them and then tested it and you know, went from place to place and, and looking at that. So there were alternative areas. We, went, we did it. Went back. Presentation. I know that Ms. Spreckelson, to my understanding, has comments. I don't know if Mr. Michael is presenting anything, and I'm sure that the ladies and gentlemen in the audience might have comments. My understanding is that the council does, and, and Mr. Michael's also does. So, council will have yourself. Sure, there'll be a five minute recess. Thank you.
uh, receive copies, but we'll distribute them again next month. I will do so. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jarrett was also copied on this letter, despite failing to copy us on his plan submission. Our review of the revised plan is ongoing. Our professionals have identified many instances of noncompliance with the Township Zoning Ordinance Subdivision, Land Development Ordinance, and the Stormwater Management Ordinance. Thus, as I indicated earlier, contrary to Applebee's Council's assertions, this plan is not a block by right plan. They are requesting now six waivers. It started out as four waivers. Now we're up to six waivers tonight. And waivers need to be in writing and submitted to the Township. And I don't think that the two extra waivers that are being requesting tonight were provided to the Township. We did not know about it until tonight. We are also of the opinion that the development as proposed cannot be filled as contemplated without violating other applicable state and federal laws. In addition to the failure to comply with the requirements of proper township ordinances, the plan contemplates numerous activities, the clear cutting of over 53 acres, substantial disturbance of steep slopes, the destruction of literally thousands of notable trees, and the destruction of historical and cultural resources, many of which would require rape waivers from the Township Subdivision and Land Development Ordinance. Thus, before I get into the specific plan deficiencies, which I will, the bottom line tonight is this Planning Commission has the authority to recommend denial of this plan. This Planning Commission has a legal basis to recommend denial of this plan. This Planning Commission should recommend denial of this plan. Residential use, there's not a special exception required 
There is not a conditional use that's required, and there's not a ban that's required. The use, is it permitted use in this district? Okay, thank you. But there are variances that need to be obtained in order to comply with the zoning ordinance provisions. And that salvo provision is not limited to use variances. It says any inherent in any proposed subdivision and or land development. I understand your position. Thank you. Okay, turning to the violations of the zoning ordinance. Section 210-4.A, definition of buildable area, building envelope. The definition of building area does not allow inclusion of setbacks from floodway and flood fringe areas or areas of steep slopes and very steep slopes. At least 71 of the 160 new building lots depicted on the plan include steep slopes or very steep slopes within the building area. Of those, at least 29 have steep or very steep slopes occurring over at least three consecutive two-foot contour lines. Building envelopes for these lots need to be re-evaluated as at least 20 of these lots require relocation or loss of a unit. This needs to be determined by the Zoning Hearing Board. This cannot be determined by this Planning Commission. And that is why the applicants need to withdraw this plan and go before the Zoning Hearing Board and request this variance. In addition, Section 210-1283C, Coordination with Environment, this section states that as part of the design standards, the plan shall, shall show a pattern of development which preserves trees, natural features, and historic resources. The landscape plan depicts 2,973 trees greater than 12 inches in diameter to be removed. Even this number is only an estimate and no actual counts were taken over the entire tract. The proposed preservation of natural features has not been indicated on the plans. Again, the requirement says shall show. This is not shown on the plans. A variance is required. Five of the six historic structures were put on the plan and also proposed for demolition. Section 210-27B, R2D, Residence District Yard and Area Regulations. The section refers back to regulations in Section 210-11 and relates to 210-12A3B1. Lot area is 21,780 square feet minimum. Lots 30 and 112 have lot areas less than 21,780 square feet. A variance is required. Section 210-183.1, Historic Preservation Purposes. D, encourage continued use of historic resources and facilitate their appropriate reuse. F, encourage the preservation of historic settings and landscapes. G, discourage the unnecessary demolition of historic resets. Again, this plan proposes to remove conquered <coughs> historic resources 22, 23, 24, 26, and 27. That's five out of six historic resources on the property. That does not encourage the continued use of historic resources and facilitates their appropriate reuse. Again, a variance is required. Section 210-183.10C, 3C2, Historic Resources Mitigation Measures. Any structure to be built within 300 feet of a historic resource must have 10% glass on any wall facing the historic resource in the public way, and the design must include a vertical bay design with 16 foot to 24 dimensions for each bay, and the gable end of the roof face must face the historic resource. Lots 8 to 10 have their dwelling units located within 300 feet of the Concord Township Historic Resource number 19 and need to follow those mitigation members, uh, measures. And we have seen no proof of that this evening as well. Again, a variance would be required unless they can prove that those, they will meet those measures. Section 
220 degree reductions in lot size. This is similar to the previous uh, variance that I stated with regard to the minimum square footage of the lots. This reduction in lot size section says no lot shall be so reduced that the area of the lot or the dimensions of the open spaces shall be smaller than herein prescribed. Again, as I said before, lots 30 and 112 are under the minimum lot area required and variance is required. The subdivision of land development plan submitted by applicants, as I just indicated, violate at least six zoning ordinance provisions. Two of the zoning ordinance provisions violate relate to lot size and buildable area. Failure to conform to the lot size requirements of the zoning ordinance constitutes a fundamental defect in a subdivision land development plan rendering rejection of the plan appropriate. And that is case law. Section 16039A14 streets. 
Any street not designed as a through street shall be designed to township cul-de-sac requirements found in subsection B. No proposed street is designed as a through street. Therefore, all streets and roads are subject to section subsection B for township cul-de-sac standard requirements. Road L is 178 linear feet and is below the minimum length of 250 feet for cul-de-sac street requirements. A waiver is required. Now, while it's true that a waiver was just added this evening for cul-de-sac streets, it wasn't explained very well what that waiver was for because that waiver states that cul-de-sac streets shall not exceed 700 feet and shall be at least 250 feet in length. Following roads violate this provision. Road A is a cul-de-sac with a length of 2,051 square feet. Remember, the requirement is they shouldn't exceed 700 square feet. We're at 2,051. Road D with a length of 1,024 linear feet. Road G is a cul-de-sac with a length of 1,282. Road H is a cul-de-sac with a length of 1,602. Road I is a cul-de-sac with a length of 1,005. This is all Road K is a cul-de-sac street with a length of 825. All of the streets violate that provision of the subdivision land development ordinance and require waivers. It's not just one waiver. It's a waiver that's requesting one, two, three, four, five, six streets not to comply with the provision.
violate, as I indicated, at least 17 substantive provisions of the Township Subdivision and Land Development for which applicants have not requested waivers. Thus, the Planning Commission must do not recommend denial of applicants' plans. In addition to violations of the zoning ordinance that I just discussed, as well as the Township Subdivision and Land Development Ordinance, there are also a number of violations of the Stormwater Management Ordinance. And these were also contained within the letter. Uh, they relate to performance standards, erosion sedimentation, stormwater management plan requirements, um, and the failure to provide necessary stormwater management information is a valid basis on which to deny a subdivision of land development plan. Again, that's case law, and that's the hair case. Applicants' failure to comply with the requirements of the township stuff um, stormwater Management Ordinance supports a Planning Commission recommendation to deny applicants' plans. Turning to the waiver request. The applicant has requested, now we're up to six waivers. Two have not been submitted in writing as are the requirements of the Township Subdivision Land Development Ordinance. But they're now requesting six waivers from the ordinance. Two of the waivers requested seek relief from tree protection and replacement standards. Now, a municipality may grant waivers only where such waivers are deemed to be appropriate in the interest of the municipality. The denial of a subdivision and land development plan may be properly based on the rejection of an applicant's waiver request. It is the applicant's burden for the requirements of the Township Subdivision Land Development Ordinance to state in full the grounds and facts of unreasonableness or hardship on which the request for waivers is based, the provisions of the ordinance involved, and the minimum modification necessary. Once the applicant meets this burden, which they clearly have not this evening, a waiver may only be granted if the Board of Supervisors, upon the recommendation of the Planning Commission, determine that the literal enforcement of the provisions of the ordinance will exact undue hardship because of peculiar conditions pertaining to the land in question, and provided that the modification will not be contrary to the public interest, and that the purpose and intent of the ordinance is observed. This is a very rigorous standard, and the applicants have not proven this standard this evening. Applicants request four mo six modification waivers to Township Subdivision Land Development. As I said, two of the waivers relate to tree replacement and buffering. Applicants alleged hardship in their letter. They haven't stated a hardship yet tonight. I didn't hear any. But in their letter, their, their alleged hardship is that the replacement requirement is significant. They fail to demonstrate that there's any undue hardship peculiar to the land. Rather, it's just applicants espouse hardship that which is personal to applicants. It's too rigorous a burden for the applicants to meet. They would have too many trees they would have to replace. That is not a valid basis of hardship. And it really is Commission has the authority to recommend denial of a plan for even a 
single non-compliance, and here there are many. A number of waivers have been requested from various provisions of the Subdivision Land Development Ordinance providing for environmental and other protection. The Planning Commission has no obligation to recommend these, especially since the applicant has failed to meet the rigorous standards required for the grant of waivers. There are waivers that have not been requested but appear to be required for this plan. The township may turn down a plan that fails to properly request all necessary waivers and provide justification for each. And for all of these reasons, we respectfully request that the Planning Commission recommend denial of the plan. Uh, that have been submitted uh, by the applicant 
We have we reviewed both uh, submissions to date. Uh, Mr. Close mentioned earlier our first comment letter was sent out on June 2nd. Uh, as he explained, over 100 comments. Our second letter was sent out on October 10th. Uh, that was whittled down to about 50 comments. Uh, council walked through some of the, uh, of the comments as well as Mr. Close. And have you provided uh, review letters to address uh, any and all deficiencies that you found or you considered to be lacking uh, with respect to this plan? Yes. And have you recommended uh, to this planning commission that uh, should, should they approve it, what conditions should be set forth? Yes. Finally, sir, is, is it unusual or is it customary to have modifications addressed between a preliminary plan and a final plan approval? I would say it's customary. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Committee, are you present? Would you please identify yourself for the record? I'm Thomas J. Kimita. And have you uh, reviewed the various submissions of the app? Yeah. Yes. And have you provided a re review letter uh, to address the deficiencies and, and set forth uh, your comments to this planning commission? Yes, in a letter dated October 16, 2014. Thank you, that's all I have. Turn up the volume on the soundboard. Is that loud enough? No. 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 Raise your voice. Is that good enough? Yeah. Thanks. Um, all right, yeah, Julie's talked about the legal uh, parts of this project, and uh, we thought it might be useful to conclude just with. Analysis of some of the resources uh, that would be affected by it. Uh, to summarize some of the results that our consultants have developed, a number of the topics that are covered in this presentation have been addressed earlier this evening. So when we get to those in the interest of time, I will simply uh, ask Diana to page through them. Uh, but anybody wants a copy of the full PowerPoint? Um, this just summarizes our team. Uh, John introduced his, uh, our civil engineer is Bob Blue. Uh, we have two land planners, uh, Ken Amy and Jay Cooperson, uh, an ecologist who's focused on woodlands as well as ecology, Jim Schmidt, uh, a traffic engineer, Jeff Lamara, an economist, Peter Angelides of EconSult at the Wharton School, and a historical consultant, Jane Dorchester of Westchester. Uh, you've met Julie, she and Mark Jones are principal lawyers. Uh, they're helped by Richard Frazier and Christina Desenza, who are both environmental and land use lawyers. Our conclusion, above all else, from reviewing the plan, from reviewing the materials provided by our consultants, is that in important respects, the information provided by uh, the applicants to the township is incomplete. The consequence of that is that informed decisions are difficult, if not impossible. Some of the information is information that is required by law, by which we need the code. And the consequence, further consequence is, therefore, that the Planning Commission can only with difficulty determine that the law has been applied with. We'll make that point in several areas as we go along. I think we've all recognized that there will be significant destruction of natural, historical, and cultural resources. Let's look at a few of them. Uh, we've talked earlier about the Delaware County Natural Heritage Inventory. Uh, they've identified these properties as home to one of the last remaining stands of interior forest. Uh, some of 
of the trees are estimated to be 200 to 300 years old. 18 rare or endangered species have been identified on the property. Uh, the property is laced with springs, streams, and wetlands, and is part of a significant watershed. And most recently, the Pennsylvania Environmental Control Board uh, has approved testing of all the streams on these properties to determine if they should be upgraded to high quality. The Natural Heritage Inventory recommended the following for these properties. Allow the woodlands to continue to revert to old growth forest. Institute erosion control. Provide greater protection against stormwater runoff and provide for 328-foot buffers outside the 100-year year flood plan. And finally, in what those of us who lived there actually wouldn't much like, they recommended reintroducing beavers to restore the wetland ecology. This plan contemplates, as we've heard tonight, 53 acres of clear cutting, 21 acres of storm basin, three miles of roads. We think the 53-acre number is low. A number of the stormwater basins probably can't be sited where they're planned. Therefore, more clear-cutting, which we've estimated at 10 acres, may be required. Uh, you'll see in a minute we did 24 site samples of the woodlands. Uh, rather than three. Uh, we estimate more than 3,000 trees, and I actually knocked 500 off, so that number couldn't be questioned. Uh, we've estimated 300 notable trees, that is 36 inches in caliber, and we've estimated more than 2,000 12-inch caliber trees. That latter estimate, by the way, is consistent uh, with the estimate of the applicants. 82% of the interior forest will be destroyed. 3.5 acres of the interior forest in the National Monument will be destroyed. Light blue shows the areas of clear cutting. The numbered sites are the sample sites where we took our forestry samples. Uh, there is an accepted methodology for measure for estimating trees, we use that methodology. This is the second part of the development. White blue again shows the clear cutting, and the red dots and numbers show the sample locations. Ah, uh, that's a notable tree. For those of you who've been on the property, uh, you will know that it really feeds uh, the east and west branches of Beaver Creek, and it's wet. There's a typical scene just off the site to be developed, actually almost immediately adjacent to a proposed stormwater basin. The applicant's environmental study missed 17 springs seven waterways of the United States, and seven wetlands. <laughs> now, there now follows a series of maps that are just difficult to read, so I would just scroll through them, but they identify all of the missed waterways. Why does this matter? Well, for one thing, some information that's required by the code isn't provided. For another thing, it's hard for the township officials to make good decisions without accurate information. Here are some examples. Thirteen houses are sited on hybrid soils. Road I ends in a stream. In some cases, legally required buffers aren't maintained because the waterway wasn't identified. Several of the horse trails have been relocated so they go across waterways. Some of the missed waterways 
or those of exceptional or high quality. Without knowing how much water is up there, you can't possibly estimate how much will come down the hill accurately. And a whole bevy of Pennsylvania laws come into play that we can't even think about until we've accurately identified the wetlands. Stormwater. Six of the stormwater management areas are on steep slopes. Five are located on hybrid soils. Seven, no preliminary soil or any soil analysis has been provided. One is in an identifiable wet, wet location where we found water 40 inches below the ground. Part of the, one of the stormwater clearances talks about removing 100% of the trees in a small area of 1.55 acres of steep slopes. That's another violation. We think that somewhere between 140 and 155 acres is likely to be disturbed. Talk about farmland. The U.S. government has identified the preservation of farm prime farmland as a national priority. Concord Township seeks to preserve prime farmland. The properties here include about 150 acres of prime farmland. None of it is identified as such on the plan. Once the building is done, it won't be usable, and a lot of it will be under houses and beneath roadways. All of the green is prime farmland. Now, those of us who farm this, uh, you know, that's a different story, but technically it is prime farmland. Okay, historical and cultural resources. We've counted 18 standing and archaeological remains of houses, barns, spring houses, and other agricultural buildings from the 18th and 19th century. The documentary record for these properties is excellent, and we think that we can identify at least another five to seven historic, historical archaeological sites. About half of the properties retain the identical property and field boundaries that they had in 1815. That is extremely rare in southeastern Pennsylvania. Before I was a lawyer, I was a historian, by the way. Uh, Delaware County identified the properties as having high archaeological value. They recommended an archaeological study before the development. The United States has declared Quaker settlement patterns to be of national interest and importance. Uh, yeah, there you go. One of the interesting things about Beaver Valley is that it was used continuously from about 1682 until the mid-20th century for agriculture, milling, and other what we call as historians proto-industrial activity. When the properties were acquired by their current owners or their predecessors, uh, they didn't do anything with them. The net result is that the landscape is literally peppered with historical archaeological sites, walls, standing buildings, all of which can be tied to their original users and owners. These properties are an important piece of that story, and that's partly why the Pennsylvania Museum and Historical Commission determined that they could possibly, not that they qualified that whole process, qualify for inclusion on the National Register. Under the plan, all but one house, one spring house, and one outbuilding go. Here's some of what goes. 
Project Green. One more. Isaac Green Farm. Isaac Green had this property in 1815. He occupied it for the entirety of the 19th century. That barn replaced an earlier log and plank barn. He got in trouble for interfering with Concord Township's first schoolmaster's disciplining of his son. He was one of the most successful dairy farmers in the township. That barn was built probably 1830 or so. That's what remains of it. That will go. So will Isaac's new house, built around 1800, that replaced the 18 by 30 foot story and a half log house whose remains can still be found on the property. There goes Isaac's spring house. Now, you might think, well, why does the spring house matter? Beginning about 1800, the lands were exhausted in this area and farmers need to find a new way to make money. And what did they do? They got into dairy. And what was dairy? They made butter. And who made the butter? Not the boys, but the girls. <laughs> butter, Philadelphia, and the environments, including Concord Township, were one of the most important butter-producing regions in the world. And the butter was shipped to Europe and Philadelphia cream cheese. As Joan Jensen has shown in her uh, very pioneering book, Loosening the Bonds, the making of butter led to a fundamental transformation in women's role in the household and the economy. Isaac's cousin's house goes to this house was built in 1809. It's dated. Uh, it's remained largely intact in some now dilapidated state. But it was part of a family complex that we'll see in a few minutes. And some of its importance derives from the fact that this was the ninth smallest town in Concord Township at the time. It is almost unheard of for a farmhouse from a, a small farm like that to survive. Oh, and that's the barn that goes with it. There are virtually no farms of that size and that scale on that kind of small farm still in place. There's Daniel Green's house. That's gone too. Quaker Settlement Patterns. As I said, when the president declared the adjacent properties a national monument, one of the rationales for doing that was that there was evidence of Quaker Settlement Patterns on the ground and in, in the standing buildings. This is a map of Beaver Valley Road, drawn in 1815 by the Orphan's Court, when the Green family's lands were divided among the children and grandchildren into four parcels. One went to Daniel, one went to Isaac. And there they are. No, no. And there are the Greens in 1815. There's Jesse, Thomas, Isaac, and Daniel. The property lines are identical today, and they will be lost. The trails. We've heard much about the trails, and I think I will only say one or two things, as I expect some others may say a few things about it. One of the most interesting things about the trails is that either the Woodlawn map nor the Township map nor any other map actually documents them accurately. The riders went out a few weeks ago and measured and rode them 
and there are large numbers of threads that have been used for 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60 years in some cases that are, appear to be unknown to the property owner, but are between three and six feet wide. Using that as the measure, it looks like about 40% of all the trails will be lost under this plan. Uh, a lot of folks are interested in traffic, uh, so we had our economist and our traffic engineer uh, look a little bit at things, and we'll just scroll quickly through because those reports have been provided. Um, uh, what we see is a backup on Beaver Valley Road of about 165 feet of right now. Now, that doesn't seem like a problem unless you know the road. Right turns will be difficult, maybe impossible. There will be say, an effect on safety. Egress will be impeded from the Walgreens, and so forth and so on. Our civil engineers have estimated it will cost between three and four million to fix Beaver Valley Road. Importantly, the traffic study provided by the applicant doesn't contain magic words that most traffic studies do. Those words are, quote, safe and efficient access and egress can be provided to and from the site while maintaining a safe and convenient operation for all roadway users. Ethics rules prohibit using those words if you don't believe them to be true. <laughs> Nor does the traffic study take into account Walgreens the name of road development, or the other things that we know are coming online. The increase in traffic will hasten the day that 202 needs to be improved. We've actually done the costing, done the drawing. It looks like that's a 12 to 20 million dollar project. Other costs. Schools, 500,000 a year deficit. If we determine the township needs a police force, that runs about 2.5 million a year. Uh, there are several studies showing that housing values deteriorate, increase in proximity to open space and deteriorate the full loss of open space. So, the short answer is, this will cost us all money. And that's it. Thank you for your time. Bicentennial Fellowship, which just tells you how old I am. Uh, 
uh, for the most promising, uh, one of the three most promising American historians of my generation. I subsequently won the Abbott Wolf Cummings Prize for the best essay in vernacular architectural history, uh, which was an essay on southeastern Pennsylvania architecture. Um, my mother said, you need to make a living. And so I went to law school. <laughs> I've been a lawyer ever since. But um, yeah, I, I, I was a serious historian for roughly 13 years. Thank you. It's my understanding, uh, Mr. Chairman, that at this point in time, you're going to allow Mr. Jaros to make some comments. Is that correct? Yes. And then that will conclude the information uh, gathering session of this commission, is that correct? And then you're going to take a recess. Okay, Mr. Jarvis. Thank you. I would hope I'd be afforded the same respect Mr. Michael was, but apparently that's not the case. Um, with respect to Ms. Von Sproppelson's comments, and I'm not going to go through them line item by line item, but let me just focus. If I may, if I may for, for behalf of the board, uh, we know council, we understand there's some jousting going on, and, and trust me, uh, neither uh, Mr. Giles, your, your comments nor council's comments are, are, are will in any way affect the decision, so I just merely ask you both to refrain from any more comments in that regard, and let's just proceed with comments on the merits. Sure. With respect to the uh, plans, um, there was some jousting with respect to we not supplying copies of the plans, but I can't help overlook the fact that we filed this application on May 23rd, 2014. We presented to the township on two separate occasions, and the last time we were before this planning commission, we were told that there were numerous violations that Ms. Freckleson's um, clients, as well as I assume Mr. Michael, felt. Well, we didn't see those comments until 5 o'clock last Thursday afternoon. Um, not much time to respond, but let's focus on those comments for a minute. With all due respect to Ms. Von Spreckelson and her opinions, and Mr. Michael and his opinions, who, by the way, we met with Mr. Michael early on in this process, and we absolutely understand that Mr. Michael does not want to see this property developed. And we got to see it developed. So let me focus on a concept that every one of you... It looks like we have some agreement on this one. Yes. But let me focus on one concept that every one of you in the room, including Mr. Michael and Ms. Von Spreckelson, have, and those are property rights. And those rights give you the ability to do what you want with your property, assuming it complies with the applicable zoning requirements in effect. I submit to you, my clients now have this property under agreement. And with all due respect to Mr. Michael and his team of experts, and Ms. Von Spreckelson and her opinions, the ones that count are those two gentlemen sitting in the first and second row, the township engineer and the township planner. Rhetorically speaking, or requesting, I wonder if Ms. Von Spreckelson approached the zoning officer or the township engineer to get some type of affirmance that her opinion that we need zoning relief is required. I don't think that happened. So what we're dealing with is an opinion of those who don't want to see this property developed that we don't comply with the zoning ordinance or the sound of it. But with all due respect, I think what this planning commission needs to rely on, as well as what the Board of Supervisors need to rely on, are the township consultants that they've hired to review this plan application. Specifically, Mr. Donahue, I do agree with you with the section cited, whenever conditional use approval 
A variance or a special exception is required by Chapter 210 for any use proposed or inherent in any proposed subdivision and or land development. You have to have that relief. Well, that's why we've dealt with the township engineer and the township land planner in excess of 18 months, 20 months. So what I'm submitting to the Planning Commission or suggesting to the Planning Commission, as I would to the supervisors who ultimately have to decide on this application, is you can listen to those opposed who have opinions that we don't comply with the ordinance, or you can listen to your higher consultants who you retain in these applications to make those very decisions. And I submit to you that when you listen to the township consultants that you hire, that this application is compliant. It meets certain criteria of the zoning ordinance, the applicable criteria of the zoning ordinance and the subdivision land development ordinance, and it should be approved. I cite Ms. Von Spreckelson to Keiko 3 Inc., the Commonwealth Court decision of 2004. It says a little bit different things with respect to by rights use applications in the land development context. One of the things it says specifically. Even where the preliminary plan fails to comply with the objective substantive requirements, the governing body may, in its discretion, either reject the plan outright or grant conditional approval. We submit to you that the review letters that have been issued by your township consultants, not those opposed to the development of this tract, those letters are insufficient status to grant you the ability to recommend the application for approval. One more thing in closing. I, I, I found Mr. Michael's presentation compelling, really. But an applicant such as my clients and even anybody in this room, should they decide to develop their property, you have to go by the rules in effect. Those rules are spelled out in this book, which is the Township Zoning Ordinance and the Township Subdivision Land Development Ordinance. In processing your application on these issues that Mr. Michael set out that he has certain opinions about, you have to make application to the county, township, county, state, or federal regulatory agencies. We've done that. We've gotten our clearance letters back. So I can only surmise that our professional consultants, the township's professional consultants, the county, the state, and the federal regulatory agencies are all operating in a fog. That's the only conclusion I can make. Because with all the issues with respect to what Mr. Michael put up on the screen tonight, the county, the state, and the federal regulatory agencies disagree. Because I've got the clearance letters in my binder. So with all due respect to Mr. Michael, who does not want to see this property develop in any way, shape, or form, I respectfully disagree. And I can only rely on what I am duty-bound to apply to and that are these other agencies. So, excuse me now. So in closing, we stubborn, excuse me, I failed to submit. We do have a memorandum setting forth the two additional waiver requirements and we're adding a third. And that is with respect to the stormwater management components referenced by the opposition. We don't believe we need an ordinance, or I'm sorry, a waiver with respect to the stormwater management component because our engineer has dealt with the township engineer 
very specifically with respect to the stormwater management components of the site. But the opposition thinks we do need a waiver. So what I'm handing up to the Planning Commission is a memo I prepared before this evening's meeting to set out three additional waivers. The two we already spoke about, the cul-de-sac plank, the paving of pedestrian walkways, and lastly the third with respect to the stormwater management components. So this Planning Commission now has to decide is the application in sufficient form to make a recommendation to approve to the Board of Supervisors who will then take action on the application? On behalf of the applicant, we believe it's there. Obviously, the opposition disagrees. But again, the ones we rely on are the township consultants. We think they're the ones you have to rely on as well. That's our position. Thank you. Not so quickly there, Mr. Jarrett. Um, I took issue with uh, one or two comments made by um, Julie Von Spreckelson, and I have issue with one of the comments you just made, uh, to the extent that I think a suggestion was made that this, this board um, must only consider uh, what is said uh, by the township consultants. And I think you have to agree with me that uh, it's this board that makes the decision and, and what recommendations. I absolutely agree that you can take in other evidence, but it's this planning commission in making its recommendation that, that gets to give the weight that it so desires those specific issues. Now we're in agreement. Okay. Okay, Jim, with that, is that going to conclude the informational section? Can I just briefly, just very briefly respond? Very briefly. Very briefly. Very briefly. I just want to say that what I discussed this evening and all the violations of the zoning ordinance and the subdivision land development ordinance, those are not opinions, those are fact. And we welcome the issues that we have raised, which would then make it appealable. So we welcome, welcome those reviews. Did you seek a determination from either the zoning officer or the township engineer on any of those? We will. You will, but you have it. We're stating it tonight. This is before the planning commission, and we will present that. But you have it. We will. Yeah, we only got the revised plans. We understand where we October. are. This is the plan. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Okay. So with that, folks, that's going to conclude the informational uh, session, and I think the board is going to take a uh, five-minute recovery part.
Understanding about the request, and the applicant has no objection to extend for an additional 30 days for the current extension. Thank you, sir. Um, the planning commission would like the following items addressed. Uh, they would like the uh, township secretary to ask the uh, sewer authority to comment on this particular project. Uh, any of the submissions that have been made uh, by the applicant. Uh, they would like to have a response, and that response they want on or before November 5th. Uh, this board also needs time to address the comments uh, rendered by Thomas Kamita dated 10-2014, uh, and also those of uh, Mr. Klein, uh, which were dated on October 17th. Uh, finally, uh, the board would like the township consultants to address the memorandum handed up this evening by Mr. Jarrows, which is dated October 20th, 2014. And this is the memorandum uh, concerning the additional waivers. So they would like the township consultants to address those, those waivers that were, are being requested. And then finally, um, and, and significantly, this board would like the applicant uh, to put in writing um, what his intentions are with respect uh, to the six historic structures, um, and, and, and they want details in, in that regard. Have I summed up uh, correctly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the concerns this evening? Yes, sir. Just one thing I want everyone to understand, that this planning commission does not accept this kind of additional information and data uh, at, our, at our public meeting when we are to make a decision upon. That's the reason that we're, we're moving the way we are, uh, uh, um, asking for the applicant to grant us an extension. Uh, we, this has not been a policy of ours in the past, and we're going to continue that way. So we're going to uh, take the, uh, the uh, extension that's been granted, and we'll uh, do another 30 days. And, and on that note, to get to that room. Hold on. So this board will then render a decision uh, on, the plan is to render a decision on November the 17th. Um, and November the 17th, and for, for now we'll say in this building uh, at 6 p.m., but the township secretary uh, will, will confirm that, but that will be the plan. Mr. Donahue, just a request for clarification. The planning commission won't render a decision. They'll make a recommendation, correct? A decision with respect to the recommendation, correct. Thank you. I too have to be clarified once in a while. That's just true. Okay, and, and, and uh, Mr. Curlin has indicated it was a July 9th. Uh, Concord Township Sewer Department request, is that correct? It's a letter from 
There was a request from Walt Basler to investigate the possibility of using a gravity sewer system. Has, has there been correspondence since? Uh, I can take that call. Uh, yes, there was a request um, for our analysis or any schematics or plans that we had that would allow the sewer department to kind of understand our opinion why a low pressure ground pump system is recommended over a conventional gravity system. Prior to submitting the plans in May 23rd, 2014, we had done a schematic, I think it was March 5th, 2014. Um, in September, we kind of refined that as it relates to the 160 lots, and we did provide that information to the sewer department, so they, they have that um, in their possession. And I believe that is something that they are still looking at, um, but that's, that's the latest that we have. And no feedback from them? Um, nothing official now. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. May I ask one question, please? Just to clarify, uh, is the Planning Commission making any type of request to the Township Consultants to address the issues that we've raised tonight with regard to zoning ordinance, subdivision land development, and stormwater management ordinance violations? No, the Planning Commission is asking to address the issues that, that I've outlined. Uh, many of the issues that you raised this evening have already been addressed by the township uh, planning consultant. Well, I disagree with you respectfully, but uh, we would ask. And I understand you disagree with me, but they have provided comments based on your comments. That, that's a matter of record in the written. So. But thank you. The, town, the zoning ordinance is what I, in particular, is what I'm referring to. We, raised a number of zoning ordinance violations, none of those have been addressed. I've addressed one with, with various planning members who asked me my opinion. I gave it to them. They're my, I, I consult with them. And, uh, so we're making a formal request that the consultants review the provisions we've raised years stating that they have that's the position that they're not being asked. No, I'm, I'm saying that I, I did review what you what you raised and I've offered an opinion in that regard to members of the Planning Commission. Those that asked me, I offered, I offered them my opinion. Thank you. That is, that is the process, man. This is a meeting. We're following process. In fact, this board is going beyond process. Thank you. That's up to the chairman whether or not there's My understanding is no, but that's going to be up to him. And he has said no. In the informational section is up session is over as far as comment. They want the township consultants to address the issues we've raised. Thank you. He's made his decision. Everybody shut up. No more business as usual. We're trying to continue with the schedule for our agenda on this evening. Um, and Thomas, I advise that the schedule for the month has been Caucus meeting comes so, up on October uh, 27th. The next agenda meeting is November 10th. And the public meeting probably is November 17th. Uh, so now we'll, we can entertain a motion for adjournment.